<laughs> and I confess that those messages are not just for the children. <laughs> Come on. Come on. Demons? Are there really demons out there? I mean, isn't that just something that's a myth from, from cultures that are just not as advanced as us? Or, come on. I mean, we've, haven't you heard? Theologians have told you this, that when the Bible was complete, the canon was written, they had met in Rome, and they decided this is the scripture. It's what we have right here. It's what we read, right? That, that when that was complete, we didn't have to deal with demons anymore because they, they no longer were present. In fact, uh, spiritual powers changed. The Holy Spirit's gifts changed all at that time because you didn't even need all of the spiritual gifts at, at that point any longer because everything was taken care of because the Bible was there, right? Come on, demons. The fact is, demons have not all been taken care of. They are still present, and it is a biblical term and a biblical lesson that we need to learn to use the resources of God to stand against the powers of darkness. Three years ago, we did a survey in our church right here, and, and in that survey, one of the questions we asked is, is evil really present today? Is evil really present today? So we didn't, want to, we didn't use demons or Satan or anything. Just, is evil really present today? Do you know that 90% of the people responded with, I just lost it. <laughs> yes, and he is. 90% of the people said, yes, and he is. Because they even went on to say, is the devil or evil forces, do they want to attack our ministry? And they said, 90% of the people from this church here, they must be weird, because they all said, 90%, yes, he is trying to attack this church, and he is attacking this church. Oh, by the way, do you know what the second choice was in the, about the rest of the, the, the 10%? Probably. <laughs> probably he is, and probably he's attacking this church. In other words, most of the people in this church believe that evil is still present, still trying to do things to undermine the ministry of God in this community and around the world. Uh, apparently, people at FBC <laughs> believe that the evil is present today. When I worked on this in, in my um, thesis, it was important to me to make sure that we did not make an overemphasis and an unnecessary indulgence in the influence of evil. It concerns me that, that there are really these two dangers. In fact, James Padgett says, Satan wants to destroy your relationship with God, your potential for serving him and bearing spiritual fruit, your character, your reputation, your health physically, mentally, and emotionally. He wants to destroy your spouse, your children, your parents, your friendships and ministry relationships, your finances and possessions, your hope and faith in God, your love, your sense of esteem as God's child, and anything else he can destroy. Satan wants to do that. Too often it seems like people either give evil way too much focus, which is extremely dangerous, or no focus at all, which is equally as dangerous. <clears throat> Do you remember C.S. Lewis's statement? Kind of summarizes this. He said, there are two equal and opposite errors into which our race can fall about the devils. One is to disbelieve in their existence. There's no devils. There's no Satan. It's just myth. And the other is to believe and to feel an excessive and unhealthy interest in them. They themselves are equally pleased by both errors and hail a materialist or a magician with the same delight. So if you're on the side of that, there's no devils. We're just in a world uh, that's created by ourselves. There's no spiritual forces out there we need to worry about that. That's just as dangerous, and the demons like it. 
as the person who's over here giving so much attention that everything's about Satan. Satan's doing everything. Satan's getting credit for every wrong that takes place, for every sin that we commit, when Satan's simply just watching and seeing us to make our own choices. The text for this morning comes from Acts 19, verses 13 to 20. If you have your Bibles, I'd encourage you to read along with me. <clears throat> Some Jews who went around driving out evil spirits tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who were demon-possessed. They would say, in the name of the Jesus whom Paul preaches, I command you to come out. Seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, were doing this. One day, the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, and Paul I know about, but who are you? Then the man who had the evil spirit jumped on them and overpowered them all. He gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. When this became known to the Jews and Greeks living in Ephesus, they were all seized with fear, and the name of the Lord Jesus was held in high honor. Many of those who believed now came and openly confessed what they had done. A number who had practiced sorcery brought their scrolls together and burned them publicly. When they calculated the value of the scrolls, the total came to 50,000 drachma. In this way, the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. When Jesus began his ministry, do you remember one of the first things that happened to him as he started his ministry? Jesus was completely aware that there was a supernatural enemy that he was going to battle the entire time he was here, and specifically with his axe on the cross. And he knew that enemy was going to try to hinder him along that journey. Clinton Arnold says, Jesus was so aware that there was a supernatural enemy who would organize his malevolent forces to powerfully oppose the carrying out of his mission. With this in mind, Jesus assured his followers of his presence with them and that he possessed all authority over this realm. What did Jesus say as he gets the disciples ready? He's about to ascend up into heaven. And what's he start off with? All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, now go and make disciples of all nations. So what do you think? Are demons present today? Could they be here in this room? And, and if they are present, do we have the ability to cast them out? Or do we just ignore them? 1 John 4, 1 is a passage I mentioned last week. And incidentally, I did, I, I, I'm reading last week. Did you all catch this when I was reading 1 John 4? I copied 1 John 4, 1 through 4 into my iPad. Did anyone notice what was missing when I read 1 John 1 to 4? When I read it from my iPad, verse 4 was missing again. Why verse 4? Have any of you started looking it up yet? Have you started looking it up yet? Verse 4, 1 John 4, 4. For the one who is in you is greater than the one in the world. And Jesus Christ says, I have authority, and I'm giving that authority to my disciples, and that authority is above all other authorities, all other powers. One of the books that I studied uh, in regard to this was uh, by an anthropologist, a man who studies people and history and things like that, and, and a theologian, and, and his name's Hebert, and he, he talked about what we can do to make sure that we are testing the spirits. This is what 1 John 4, 1 says. Test the spirits. See if something is from God or not. And what's the best way? He says, well, ask that spirit. <laughs> if you're really dealing with the spirit, ask that spirit, it, do you believe that Jesus is the Christ? Do you believe that Jesus died and rose? You know, basic question, right? By the way, that's a great tool to use if you're going to deal with spiritual forces. Hebrews says there's eight points that we should apply to each of our settings. Number one, does the finding give glory to God rather than to humans. If you're going to test a spirit, is the spirit giving of whatever it is, testing a sermon. And you should do this. Use this eight-point scale as you listen to sermons from right here at this, at this church. Does it give glory to God or does it give glory to a person? If my sermons give glory to me, we're all in big trouble. 
run or pray against me or something, okay? First test. Second test. Does our teaching recognize the lordship of Christ? Is this about the fact that Christ is Lord over all things? He is God, and we're putting him in as our authority. Or are we doing something different, maybe our own selves? Number three, does what we discern conform to spirit scriptural teaching? When you sense that something is spiritual, that maybe something even could be de demonic or whatever, or is it, is it from God? You're, you're, you're praying for something, and, and the prayer gets answered, and, and you're su surprised by that. Are you testing it to see whether that is conforming to scriptural teaching? For example, like the two ladies that, that, that they believed that God told them they were supposed to paint their bodies with mustard and drive around the town naked. Does that conform with scriptural teaching? Don't think so. <laughs> so test things to see whether they conform with scriptural teaching. Four, are our leaders accountable to others in the church? The leaders right here. In fact, we even talk about accountability. We have a guy, accountability principles that we're supposed to hold to. Do, do leaders make themselves accountable to others? Or have they put themselves up onto a pedestal which is seriously dangerous for them and the church. Five, do our leaders manifest the fruit of the Spirit? I just want to remind you of something, that I personally believe that some of the greatest weapons we have against evil are some of the ones we take the most for granted. And the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5, incidentally, sometime look at the context of Galatians 5 and the fruit of the Spirit, 21 and following. And the fruit of the Spirit is what? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. Why does Paul, anointed by the Spirit, tell us that those are the fruit, that that's the power of God available to us if we're going to do spiritual weaponry? Because if you look right before that, you'll find all the deeds of the flesh and the deeds of darkness, and they're pretty nasty. And the weapons we have to fight against the darkness, love, joy, peace patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And those are things that are weapons that the world doesn't use. Can you think about that? You're in a fight with somebody. You're angry at them. You're really ticked off at them. And you turn to them and you say, I, I love you so much. <laughs> Don't think so. <laughs> or let me kill you right now and beat you up with my patience. Okay, <laughs> somebody's doing something to your yard. Really? Let me be kind back to you. I'll show you what you just did to me. Think about that. The weapons we fight where they're not the weapons of the world, but they have power to break down strongholds, 2 Corinthians 10, 4. He goes on. He says, is our learning leading us towards spiritual maturity? Are the things that we are learning about God, are they helping us to become more mature? In other words, are we living out what God is teaching us, not just getting head knowledge? And then is the truth kept in balance with other truths? So, so Lewis would warn us about putting too much focus on demons, but also about never talking about them. And lastly, are we being led to seek the unity of the body of Christ, or is it divisive? The things that we're teaching, things that we're learning, is this bringing unity, or is it bringing division? <clears throat> Let's look at our text again. Some Jews who went around driving out demons, driving out evil spirits, tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who were demon-possessed. They would say, in the name of the, of the Jesus whom Paul preaches, I command you to come out. You see, people were actually doing exorcisms from, with magical tools as well as religious tools, uh, and, and Paul was doing it through the name and the power of Jesus Christ. And so you have these guys, and here's these seven sons of Sceva, okay? And they're like, you know, okay, well, we can cast out demons too. So we'll just do it in the name of the guy that Paul talks about. They, they don't believe in Jesus. They just know that Paul's been using this name. Sounds like a pretty magical power to them. And so we're going to use that. So in the name of the Jesus that Paul talks about, you demons come out. And the demons, how does the demon respond? <laughs> Jesus, I know. Oh, by, that's, by the way, take note of that. Take note of that. The world of darkness knows Jesus Christ. 
They don't believe in him. They don't trust him. They don't obey him. They don't follow him. But they know him. And they know of his power. They know his authority. They know he's the son of God. But they will not confess that. Remember, that's what First John, John said. You're supposed to test and see whether they believe. And they, they won't be able to acknowledge that he is the son of God. But they know it. So, Jesus I know and Paul I know, but like, who are you guys? Then the man who had the evil spirit jumped on them and overpowered them all. And he gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. And when this became known to the Jews and Greeks living in Ephesus, they were all seized with fear because they were scared of all the demons around them. Some of you don't have your Bible open. Because that's not what it says. Because that's what we would almost expect. Oh my goodness! You know, these demons, they, they, they beat up this guy, and he went, the, these guys, seven brothers, and they were, they were actually sons of the high priest in that, in that, of the priest in that area. I mean, so these guys are really spiritual guys, and if they're going to get whooped naked and bloody, we're all in trouble. Watch out for demons. What are we going to do? But no, what does it say? It says, when this became known to the Jews and Greeks living in Ephesus, they were all seized with fear, and the name of the Lord Jesus was held in high honor. Many of those who believed now came and openly confessed what they had done. Look at what starts to happen when we realize that Jesus is the authority, that Jesus has power over the darkness. Then people come and start confessing, start admitting to the garbage, the sin, the mistakes, the things that they are choosing to do. They start to admit them. A number who had practiced sorcery brought their scrolls together and burned them publicly. These are actually, and take note, folks, demonic power is real. Sorcery actually works. There are things that are extremely dangerous that are filled with demonic power. And what happens? They bring their scrolls. These are people who have been ensconced, deeply enmeshed. They're, they're sucked in to the whole idea of evil so that they've been practicing magic and sorcery with the scrolls, and they burn them publicly. And when they calculate the value of the scrolls, 50,000 drachma, a huge amount of money. And in this way, the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. Notice what happens. Not the fear of evil, not the worship of Satan, but instead, the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. Paul had power. Where did he get that power? He got that power from Jesus Christ, straight from him. Anointed by the Holy Spirit, he had power, and, and he was able to cast out demons, not because he used magic, but because he used the power of Jesus Christ. You realize this is still happening today, don't you? People are getting involved in witchcraft and black magic and various things like that in places and in countries that we call pagan. Cultures are backwards, like the United States of America. A uh, mother came to me some months ago, concerned about her daughter and the fact that her daughter was being attacked by a demonic presence in their home. She even had seen some evidence of this demonic presence. And she asked for help from us. And as we talked and prayed and shared with her, guess what she said she was doing? She says, I'm going to my fortune teller and I've been having her help me to defeat this demonic presence. That's in the United States. That's in California. That's up here on the mountain. Men attempt to use magic to expel demons, and that's what the sons of Seba did. When the leader on our, on our team saw a demon, it bothered him. Robert Clinton writes in his book, Unlocking Your Giftedness, the discerning of spirits gift refers to the ability given by God to perceive issues in terms of spiritual truth, 
to know the fundamental source of the issues and to give judgment concerning those issues. This includes the recognition of the spiritual forces operating in the issue. What did Clinton just say? When God gives the gift of spiritual discernment, he gives us the ability to recognize spiritual forces. Clinton uses, lists the following uses of the gift. In the early church, it was used to distinguish truth from non-truth in terms of verbal utterances. How would they test? Because the letters would come, and was this from Paul? Was this from you know, John? Was it, was it a true word from God or not? How would they test it? Well, they would use the gift of the distinguishing of spirits. In the church today, with the entire canon of Scripture, this gift can be used to discern whether teaching is on target or consistent with the revealed truth of the Word of God. You ought to be testing and saying, okay, Bill's talking about stuff. I might not even know about this. I might not even disagree with this stuff. How do I test to see whether it's true? Well, first off, I use the Word of God, but secondly, I use the gift of the Holy Spirit to discern. It's used to protect the church from heretical tendencies in either teaching or in practice. It's used to discern the, whether the source of a particular activity is generated by the Holy Spirit, by the person, or by the demonic realm. And some things happen in churches and they're not by the power of God. When we talked about this um, a couple years ago, I shared about what was referred to as cessationist theology. The view that the power and gifts had all served their purpose once the canon was complete. What's the canon? That's the, the Bible. The, the, where'd my Bible go? <laughs> this is the canon. Once this canon was complete, then, the, then we said, well, this, this, the gifts ended. That's cessationist theology. But, but please help me. Tell me where in this Bible it says that the gifts of the Holy Spirit ended. And yet we've come up with a theology. We've called it cessationist. We, we've based ministry on this fact. that We said, no, it all ended at a certain point in time. There is nowhere in this book where it says that happened. Nowhere. And in fact, quite the opposite, you will find that throughout this book we're talked about using the gifts and ministering to people through the power of the Holy Spirit. So let's not eliminate them. What are some texts you might want to look at? 1 Corinthians 12, Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 14, Ephesians 4. Oh, by the way, we're going to keep hearing Ephesians, aren't we? Ephesians, where we started last week, Ephesians 6, the spiritual armor and spiritual warfare and the battle that's not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, rulers of darkness in heavenly places. There's a battle going on that most of us don't see. And whether we see it or not, it's still real. One of the things that we learn from our text today is, is that Jesus' name is powerful. Incredibly powerful. And we don't need to be afraid of demons, but too many people are. Jesus battled Satan at the beginning of his ministry. In fact, if you remember before he went to actually select the disciples, he spent 40 days in the wilderness. He was praying and fasting, and during that time, Satan comes to him and tries to tempt him to do the very things that he will do, but not the way Satan wanted. Throw yourself down. Jesus will do that, but he'll do it on a cross. Well, make yourself some food. Jesus will take a couple of loaves of bread and some, several fish and feed 5,000. Tw two different occasions, he'll feed thousands. The very things, like I say, that Satan asked him to do, or Satan wants him to do it in his timing, not in God's timing. And Jesus keeps saying no, and he uses the word of God to respond. That's a practice we ought to take note of. And then he gave authority to his disciples, and that authority was to, bo to cast out demons. Do you remember it? He sent out the 12, and he said to preach the gospel, heal the sick, and what else? Cast out demons. He sent out the 72. Look in Matthew 10. Look in Luke 10. Two different stories, two different passages, two different groups of people. The 72 in, in Luke 10, he says, send, send them out. And they're supposed to do what? Cast out demons, heal the sick, preach the kingdom of God. And what's really exciting in that one is, is they come back and report, Jesus, the demons listen to us. And Jesus talks about the fact that he saw Satan falling from heaven like an angel being thrown out in fire. When we um, had our spiritual encounter three years ago, in which we were starting to say as a, as a small group here, and this included the, the leaders of the church, what did we need to do to address the spiritual forces that, that, that are trying to attack us? Um, we had a lady that had um, 
that I had worked with um, in Arizona. And the week, literally the week before, I think it was like Wednesday before the encounter started, it was an encounter that took place out at Leslie Dodge Taylor's place. And we had prayer and stuff like that. By the way, there's a side story to that. Ask Alan Russell about his trip over the edge. Or, or, or ask Alan Russell about his brand new truck that he got because of his trip over the edge. But anyway, that's a whole other side. <clears throat> but as we're doing that account, this, this lady um, who seven years earlier had said, God wants me to tell my story. And I've had a vision, Bill. I'm supposed to someday stand, at, stand in front of the people of your church and tell my story. We read Romans 8, which Romans 8 says that God works all things together for good for those who love the Lord and are called according to his purposes. He goes on to say that nothing, nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Take note, not heaven or earth, not, not life or death, not principality or powers, not nothing. That includes demons, that includes darkness, that includes death, that includes pain. Nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. So, so can anything call, pull us away from Jesus? Nothing can, is what Romans 8 says. So we read Romans 8, and then I invited this lady to stand up and tell her story. And for the next while, she shared with us how, as a young girl, she had been assaulted by her father. And then by others. And used in satanic ritual. And as a teenager, had had multiple abortions, and she watched as those babies would be killed and then used for satanic ritual. She watched their blood be used to worship Satan. She talked about her promiscuous lifestyle. She talked about all these things. And you know what she had done? What kind of God had given to her as a place of refuge in the midst of all her pain? God gave her rooms in her house, as we refer to them. Today, we call it MPD, multiple personality disorder. She developed multiple personalities, each with their own name, their own identity, their own pain. As pain would get worse, a new person would come and take the pain. And again and again, that would occur within her life. Now, you know, some of you might say, oh, that's just weird. Not for this lady. It was her reality. And, and over a significant period of time, w what we did was took every one of those girls some very young, some teenagers, some very rebellious, some very mean and angry, all with a role of protection, a role to, to provide healing. And each one of those people in her life needed to accept Jesus Christ and receive his healing and then tell Satan, you don't have, you don't have authority in this room. You need to leave and cast that demonic presence out. And there was some nasty stuff that were involved there. She told that whole story to our group there as we were praying about, God, what are we going to do here as a church as we try to address the spiritual forces? <clears throat> Let me just read to you a couple of comments. Her story moved us all to feel her pain. And to celebrate what God can do to set us free. God received glory for the first time she had shared her story in a safe environment. Yeah, seven years earlier, she had talked about that time that she saw sharing this story with the people of this church. God had fulfilled her vision. She felt new freedom because of her sharing. And it was time for us to test the spirits. Folks, demons are not all powerful. Oh, we get afraid they are, and, and they do influence people. But, but let me take note of some things. If demons are so powerful, do you remember the story of the Gerasene man in Mark chapter 5? Jesus comes up to this place on that side of the Sea of Galilee where there's this man. He's actually in a graveyard. Some of those kids don't like graveyards. <laughs> He's in a graveyard. What's he doing? He's living there. This man cuts himself with sharp objects and all, makes himself bleed. They've chained him up multiple times, and he simply breaks the chains. He's a crazy man. And when Jesus comes up and he, the man runs up to Jesus, that is a very significant thing, by the way. 
Because when he runs up to Jesus, Jesus says, who are you? And the man will say, the, actually the demons inside the man will say, we are legion. It stands for thousands. If you have a legion of demons controlling you, would you be able to run up to Jesus if they have that much power? They had so much power that they had allowed this man to break chains, to scare people off, to constantly break free, to cut himself and harm himself in, in this graveyard. So this was a really nasty set of demons. But look, when Jesus comes to a person, they don't come close to the authority that he has. And here in this very man that we do have in our scriptures, in Mark chapter 5, this legion of demons can't stop this man from saying, Jesus, help me. They're not as powerful as they want us to believe they are. Let me give you the other example. In Acts 19, 16, our text that we were just looking at. Notice what it says when it says that the seven sons of Sceva were trying to cast out this demon. What happened next? It says that they got beat up, right? Who beat them up? Well, the demons obviously beat them up, right? You better look at your text. Because the text does not say that the demons, but the man with the demons, the man attacks them, beats them up, sends them running scared. Demons do not have the power that we want to give them, that we sadly give them credit for. There's a word that messes us up in the New Testament in the way most of our Bibles translate this word. It's actually in our text as well. Did you see it? The word was demon-possessed. Some Jews who went around driving out evil spirits tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who were demon-possessed. The word that is used there that is actually dionizomai. Dionizomai. You don't even have to know any Greek, but does that sound like anything to you? Dionizomai. Demonized. The word is not about being owned by, possessed by, but influenced is what the word actually means. <clears throat> Demons influence people. Yes, they try to attack. Yes, they try to scare. Yes, they lie like their leader, Satan, the father of lies. Did Jesus cast out demons? Ought to be a yes from all of you. Yes. Did the disciples cast out demons? Yes. Did f other followers of Jesus cast out demons? Yeah. Did Paul cast out demons? Yes. Let's just go on and on. So then let me ask you this. Do you cast out demons? The Bible is loaded with examples of both their existence and the fact that Christians have authority and power to cast them out. Ephesians 6, our passage from last week, which we'll look at again next week, 10 through 18, talks about the kind of resources we have available to us. However, here's the question. <clears throat> Can a Christian be demonized? Because our problem is what we generally say is, can a Christian be demon-possessed? But can a Christian be demonized. Our words have caused us to not recognize truth. Since we're purchased with the blood of Jesus Christ, we cannot be possessed, owned, bought by any demon, including Satan himself. But that doesn't mean that we cannot be bothered or even manipulated by a demon. The word translated demon, dionizomai, Wimber actually points out, John Wimber talks about 1 Peter 5, 8. And in 1 Peter 5, 8, what is this? Humble yourself under God's mighty hand, and due time he may lift you up. Cast your anxieties on him because he cares about you. And then verse 8, be watchful, be sober. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Have you ever had the lion attacking you 
trying to devour you, guess what? You were being demonized. Oh, wait a second, Bill. Don't talk about me that way. I didn't say you were possessed. I didn't say you were owned. I didn't say you were bought, purchased, or taken over control. But the fact is, have you ever had a stranger come and live in your house? That means you allowed that stranger. Did that, did that mean they, built, they now own the house? But they could stay there, right? Did you even give them authority in the house? Like, for, do you, have you ever had a stranger come stay with you and you gave them refrigerator rights? We do that all the time when we have some guests come stay with us. You know, here's the refrigerator. Get up in the middle of the night. If you need something, take it. Okay? We, we give those rights. We can do the same thing with the power of darkness. When we sin, are we not opening the door to darkness in our lives? The more habitual that sin, or the more egregious, or the more disobedient, when we know we shouldn't be doing it, are we not opening up a place for spiritual influence? And have we not then opened up our home and a room and said, evil, here's the place where you can stay? Not to own, not to possess, because our house belongs to Jesus Christ, bought and paid for by the blood of the Lamb of God. One of the most powerful weapons we have is the name of Jesus Christ, the blood of the Lamb of God that purchased our forgiveness. Incidentally, in case you think, you know, Pastor Bill's way off on the deep, some deep end right now, there are several very significant evangelical pastors, both from non-charismatic as well as charismatic positions that hold this conviction that Christians can be demonized, attacked by demons, influenced by demons, give a space to demons in their life. Some of them are include Dr. Merrill Unger, Charles Swindoll, Hal Lindsey, John MacArthur, Don Mumford, Charles Simpson, Simpson, just a few, and there's others. When Jesus began his ministry, he started by prophesying from Isaiah. And what did that prophesy say in Isaiah 61, 1 to 2? Jesus stands up in Nazareth after having read the word sits down to talk about it and here's what he read the spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor he has sent me to bind up the broken hearted now catch this next one to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn and to provide for those who grieve in Zion and what did he do? He sat down and he said today this has been fulfilled in your hearing what has been fulfilled? Jesus came to set people free Jesus came to give us freedom from even what? from powers of darkness, from prison cells created by evil. Lots more we could do to talk about this, and some of you are like, oh boy, Bill, you're just getting out there. But I'm concerned that some of us are dealing with demonic presences and trying to ignore them. Some of us have allowed the, the, the lies of e evil to cause us to be afraid of the demons. Some of us have watched way too many movies put out by Hollywood that are intended to cause us to be afraid. From The Exorcist on down. Modern movies still try to get you to fill up this, these juices inside that will cause you to be, oh no, afraid of evil. And it's darkness that wants you to believe those lies. And my concern is, is that we're not using the tools that Jesus Christ has given to us. 
You see, when, when, when Jesus Christ comes into our life, when we have a real encounter with Jesus Christ, what happens? Did you notice it in our text? People came confessing. People came with their garbage and started burning up their garbage. That's what happens when people have a real encounter with Jesus Christ. See, it wasn't just about hearing the name. It was encountering Jesus himself. I guess what we need to ask ourselves, especially if you're already a believer, what are you trusting instead of Jesus? What are you personally trusting to fight the battle instead of Jesus? So they came confessing, and some of them had to bring their sorcery books. It still troubles me, that mother that said, yeah, I'm uh, talking to my... Um, fortune teller so that she can help us do battle with the demon. Lord, help us. Do you know Jesus? Do you know about Jesus? Or do you believe in Jesus? And there's a huge difference. The demons know about, but they don't believe in. They know he's the son of God, but they don't trust and obey him. What about you? Do you believe in Jesus? Do you know about him or do you believe in him? And do you use the name or do you know the man? Do you try to just throw it on, you know, okay, God, help me, and Jesus, do this for me, amen, in Jesus' name. Are you just using the name or do you know the man? And Jesus is inviting us to have a living encounter with him that causes us to repent and to cast out demons and to set people free. What about you? Let's pray. I want you just with your head bowed just to pause and and ask yourself that question. Ask yourself that question. Do you know about Jesus or do you truly believe in him? According to 1 John, he will show you whether that's true or not. He will show you and how it enable you to discern truth. And if you truly believe in Jesus, is there something you need to repent from today? And maybe you need to admit that you've given a room to spiritual forces. You don't really want to call it a demon, but frankly, that's probably what it is. You've given a place to evil in your life. Do you need to confess that you believe in Jesus? If so, raise your hand. And everyone else, please keep your eyes closed. This is you and Jesus. Thank you. Do you need to uh, confess that you've given a room to evil? You've opened up a spot in your life that you've allowed evil to reside in it. Raise your hand. For those of you who are raising your hand right now, you can put them down. Guess what? You don't have to holler at a demon. You don't have to cuss at them. You don't have to have a big seance. <laughs> Definitely not that. In order to cast them out. But here's what I'd like you to do in the next few moments right now. Tell that demonic presence, that spiritual force, that, that darkness you've allowed in your house, tell it it no longer has authority in your house and it has to leave. Right now, you tell it. If it's an addiction, call it by name. If it's something else and you know the name of it, it could be bitterness, I don't know. You, you know what kind of spiritual force you've allowed in. Anger, hatred, unforgiveness. In the name of Jesus Christ, leave my life. You don't have authority over me. 
tell it. Speak to it like you would an unwanted guest that's been staying in your house, and it's time for them to leave. Secondly, actually rebuke it. You're not allowed to have authority in this house because I belong to Jesus Christ. State that straightforward. Third, this is one of the best parts. Invite the blood of the Lamb of God to come and cleanse the room in your house where that evil has resided. Invite the blood of the Lamb of Jesus Christ to come wash you clean. And fourthly, thank Jesus for filling up your home with his presence. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for what you want to do in setting more people free. That what you prophesied back there in Nazareth is something you continue to desire to do here today. Thank you for what you've just done for those who raised their hand. Help us all not just to know about you, but to believe fully in you. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. I can't read lips. Test, 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 test. This, this, this struggle that she has, um, I, I want to kind of challenge us this morning. Because um, as Bill uh, shared the story, uh, I, could, I, could, I could feel the same reaction that I always have when I think about that example, when I think about this, this mother turning to a medium to try to help her child, which is completely contradictory. Mm. But I hear that, that kind of like subtle laughter and that, that judgment of like, how could this mother do that? And this morning I'm sitting there with, with this, this heartbeat beating out of my chest because God's convicting me because I've judged her. I've sat there and thought to myself, how could she possibly do this? How dare she try to help her daughter this way? sitting there this morning, though, and, and God's kind of telling me, don't, <laughs> how dare you? <laughs> we need to be praying for this mother, praying for this family, that they, they would walk away from that practice, walk away from that mindset of trying to find an answer for the darkness in the darkness. And I'm not kind of just coming up here to ramble on about, about a conviction that I had sitting in this morning, but I actually just also felt kind of this charge. Um, I feel God wanting, wanting uh, me to pray for some of you guys this morning. And I don't know who that is, but um, after service, uh, 
But Dylan, before you uh, even do, go ahead and pray without using a name. Sometimes we use the only spiritual resources we know that we have. And that's oftentimes not Christ. So, so pray without using names. To, to, to keep them convinced, Father, that there are answers beyond your word. And in Jesus' name, I, I, I pray against that voice that, that continues to guide them down that path. And Lord, I, I pray, Father, that you would break their chains, Lord. God, I, I pray that to those demonic presence. Lord, we just lift them up to you, Father. God, as your, as your children, we lift them up to you. We pray for your, for your freedom, for your peace. Time for us to end, end our worship with, so worship team, please come.